significant show of confidence that Thursday's sale vote will go through smoothly and the potential that some Commanders fans are going to get to meet new owners on Friday. That and more on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to this Thursday episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. And don't forget that you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, please throw this video a like. It'll help YouTube send it out to more Commanders fans just like yourself. And of course, if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can do so on subtext by going to join subtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. And you can go one-on-one with me, your host, David Harrison, also on Twitter at dharrison82, credential member of the media, covering your Washington commanders for commandercountry.com, part of Sports Nation's, uh, Sports Illustrated's rather, Fan Nation. Here with you every Monday through Friday, along with the everydayers and commanders fans, everydayers, I greatly appreciate you for coming through here. And uh, it looks like you have made it to the day that will be the ending of Dan Snyder uh, being the owner of the Washington commanders of everything goes through smoothly we're going to have plenty to talk about on friday with that coming up uh but the status of two unsigned rookies from the commander's draft class is what we're going to talk about today also what it means with rookies set to report on friday and we're going to discuss bleacher reports bold claim about wide receiver Jahan dotson but we're going to start off today's episode with news that broke tuesday night relative to the sale of the washington commanders according to darren haynes of WSA 9 again tweeted out on Tuesday night quote breaking the Josh Harris group expected to appear at Washington commanders training camp pep rally at FedEx field on Friday according multiple sources rally is scheduled to start at 1 p.m. the Harris group will be approved as the commander's next owner on Thursday so again that tweet came from Darren Haynes WSA 9 our Tegna sister station uh, here on the network now if that's true uh, which we all kind of presume that it is then it shows a great amount of confidence that this sale deal is going to get approved on Thursday with an anticipated closing date of Friday, uh, according to the Washington Post. And obviously, you would assume that that close will happen prior to the 1 p.m. pep rally or the the owners showing up. Uh, Typically, these guys don't like to do the, you know, count your chickens before they hatch type of thing. So if the deal hasn't closed uh, or at least, you know, is to a point where it's kind of no return type of deal, uh, I don't expect a move to be made like this. So what that kind of shows you is that this is a great sign of things to come. And as you're listening to this, depending on what time it is on Thursday uh, that you're listening or watching this, some of this process may already uh, be underway. So let's kind of recap the series of events that are going to take place on Thursday. I say recap, but really it's a preview, but we've kind of talked about all these in spurts. So let's kind of tie it all together, right? I presume sometime, uh, sometime before noon, the NFL finance committee is going to meet first. They'll be the first group to meet. And what they're going to do is they're going to vote on whether or not they're going to recommend approval or denial of the purchase deal to the rest of the NFL owners. Now, the the finance committee is an eight-owner panel, so these are all owners of NFL teams. There's eight of them. They've already met several times uh, about this specific topic, this deal, to discuss the details, check with uh, the, on the progress with the Harris group, with Josh Harris specifically. Uh, and most recently, they had an unofficial vote uh, that turned up a unanimous approval vote. Uh, in that vote reported on by the Washington Post this week, not all of the finance committee members were present or were on the, the call that was done uh, virtually. But the feeling is from the source that talked to the Washington Post that this vote will get a unanimous approval Thursday when it does happen uh, officially. Then the sale will go to the full vote. So all of the NFL owners will then convene their meeting and they will vote uh, after the, the finance committee kind of does their part. And at least 24 of the currently sitting NFL owners need to vote to approve the sale in order for it to actually go through again. Uh, according to that source, there is some expectation or anticipation of a unanimous vote uh, or close to it to approve the deal. So that would certainly be interesting. Now, once that is announced and official, then it's just a matter of signing the final documents, paperwork, handing over the keys, so to speak. Uh, and if all of that goes well, then by 1 p.m. Eastern Time Friday, Josh Harris will be the new majority owner of the Washington Commanders and will meet fans at the pep rally for the first time in his new role with his new football team of course uh there's also some anticipation not expectation necessarily but i would say anticipation anticipation that mitchell rails and Irvin magic johnson are going to be present as well uh those are the three main names that have kind of been attached to this group from the jump uh so of course those guys you know a lot of people are anticipating maybe seeing and hearing from those two as well with that 
the page can then begin to fully turn from what I would say is the darkest era of Washington football to date. But it didn't come without some drama. Even at the end, uh, Dan and his sister both had conflicting views on indemnity clauses coming with the sale. Dan doesn't want Commissioner Roger Goodell and the NFL's principal counsel, Jeffrey Pash, to avoid being held accountable for their roles in the John Gruden email leaks. And his sister didn't even want the rest of the NFL owners to be protected from having to share in any of the punishments that might come from the suit that Gruden has uh, pending against the NFL that, of course, is currently pending. Of course, the irony of that issue being central to clearing the final hurdle for the NFL is that Snyder is the one who actually put the hurdle in their path uh, in the first place, according to the recent ESPN report that says that he and Goodell essentially uh, conspired together to expose Gruden for different reasons on each side of the House. But that exposure of the Gruden emails eventually led to the House Oversight Committee launching their inquiry, which, of course, led us to a much more rapid ending uh, and destination, which is Dan Snyder no longer being the owner of the Washington Commanders. So that's where Dan Snyder is going to move into the background, into the past of the Washington Commanders franchise. Josh Harris is now going to be in control of navigating the future. And speaking of that future, we talked about franchise building blocks yesterday. Jonathan Allen, Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson were PFFs uh, identified building blocks for the Washington Commanders. I added Deron Payne uh, myself, and I added Benjamin St. Juice. I added Antonio Gibson uh, as three more building blocks. And I think Antonio Gibson probably the most interesting of the three of the three that I added because he's playing, of course, on an expiring contract. But we're going to continue talking a little bit about the future. We talked about the franchise building blocks yesterday, like I said, and it turns out that one of them actually may already be the best in his class, in his position, that according to Bleacher Report. That's going to come up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're going to do that thanks to our partners at eBay Motors who have teamed up with the Locked On Fantasy Football host, Vinny Iyer, to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week, all season long. Whether you're prepping for the draft or scouting the waiver wire every week, we're going to provide you with players that are guaranteed fits on your roster. So a draft prep underway for the upcoming season, Let's see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And if you're looking to make a smooth turn in fantasy football snake drafts with the last pick in the first round and first pick in the second round, you will be guaranteed to have a winning one-two punch of workhorse power in your backfield when taking the Colts' Jonathan Taylor and the Browns' Nick Chubb back-to-back. While Taylor is a perfect rebound candidate in a more run-friendly overall offense in Indianapolis, Chubb is also set up to dominate with more of a combined workload in Cleveland. Vinny Iyer from Locked On Fantasy Football is going to help you win your fantasy championship, and eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. The same goes with your vehicle. With eBay guaranteed fit and over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle right at your fingertips, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Air filters, brakes, batteries, taillights, alternators, shock struts, you name it, eBay Motors has it and they'll make sure it's the right fit for your car because ebay guaranteed fit helps you understand exactly what part you need for your vehicle the first time so go forth switch gears crank the ac and say goodbye to sweating if your ride needs a little fixing up because now you know you'll always be set up for success from the get-go with ebay guaranteed fit everything your vehicle is calling for is just a click away for the parts and accessories that fit your vehicle just look for the green check get the right parts the right fit and the right prices at ebaymotors.com Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day. Every day and every day as I appreciate you coming through supporting the program like you always do on a consistent basis. We're going to continue today's conversation. Switching now from the ownership situation, going back to the field, but we're talking about a bleacher report report. Uh, article, column, whatever you want to call it, that recently predicted a breakout player from each NFL team this season. And in it, it identified commander's second-year receiver Jahan Dotson as their breakout player for Washington, saying, quote, that or that Jahan Dotson could, quote, uh, emerge as one of the NFL's best young pass catchers, end quote. And now we've, we've talked about a lot of rankings here on, on the program this, this period. That's kind of what this period is usually commonly used for. There's no practices. There's usually not a lot of news unless it's bad news. Fortunately, the commanders have kind of been able to stay away uh, from the ban- bad news angle of things outside of, you know, some some Dan Snyder stuff, of course, because, uh, you know, next next year is going to be really weird if we don't have any Dan Snyder stuff to talk about. But unfortunately, there is some stuff to be resolved from his time, but that's for a later date. So 
I thought we would take this a different angle. Instead of going through and saying, you know, here's all the breakout players and here's who I think could be better breakout players, I want to run with this best young pass catcher thing, right? Because Bleacher Report talked about how Dotson got off to a fast start, uh, had the hamstring injury, and then came back to an unstable at best quarterback situation in play uh, and still led his rookie class in touchdown receptions. And that's all great. And we've, we, and, and certainly is. It's all impressive. But we've discussed that before, right? And Yes, I'm sure we're going to discuss it again over the over the months and, and all that tough stuff. But today, let's draw some comparatives. Let's draw some lines here on what that that phrase "best young uh, receiver in the NFL" means. Uh, we've already talked about the breakout season, what that would be, and in that episode, the other day, you're going to remember that we said wide receiver 24 would qualify as a as a breakout season, being a number two wide receiver uh, in, in the stat box would be enough to be a breakout season. Uh, for for Jahan Dotson, who himself has said that he does expect himself to have uh, a breakout season. So in 2022, in terms of catches, yards, and touchdowns, Dotson was 77th, 63rd, and 12th in the entire National Football League. So he was there on touchdowns, right, which is great, obviously. Now we just need to get there in catches and yards, uh, and of course, health and consistency from the quarterback position and himself staying on the field will certainly help that. Now to match 2022 wide receiver 24 stats, Dotson is going to need 75 catches, 925 yards, and six touchdowns. Is that feasible? And how far off is the one of the best young receivers line? That's really what I wanted to answer here uh, in this discussion. So to be considered one of the best young receivers, I think you have to be a top 10 performer in second-year receivers in the last 10 years, right? So just looking at second-year receivers in the NFL for the last 10 years, I think that if you're going to be one of the best young receivers in the NFL, You've got to break. You've got to rank there in the top ten of production uh, within that group, and and I think that's a fair bar to be to set to be called uh, again, quote unquote, one of the best young receivers in the NFL. So counting twenty twenty three because this is the season of production we're going to talk about, right? So this is the tenth season. So really, you're going back nine seasons. We're going to start with twenty fourteen. So I took all the receivers in the National Football League that have played from twenty fourteen to last year, and in their second years only. Um, and, and basically came up with some baseline numbers on where Jahan Dotson would have to perform and produce to be to qualify for that top 10 grouping and be bona fide one of the best young receivers in the NFL uh, today. And in order to pull that off, Dotson's going to need 87 catches, which matches Jamar Chase's numbers. He's the 10th best second year receiver in the last 10, well, really the last nine seasons uh, so far, the 87 catches. 1,196 yards would match Devonta Smith for number 10 and nine touchdowns would match Jamar Chase for number 10. So again, when you talk about the best young receivers in today's game, Jamar Chase and Devontae Smith are two of the names that will come up in those conversations. I think Devontae Smith will be left off some list, right? But Jamar Chase certainly in there on everybody's list. And Devontae Smith, because of A.J. Brown, I think that's why he falls off a few people's list. But I took a look at that list, and I said, okay, so bottom line, if he hits those numbers, right? If, if Jahan Dotson comes out of year two with 87 catches, 1196 yards, nine touchdowns, Boom, he's one of the best young receivers in the NFL. Nobody's going to argue with that. Uh, and that's it, just it's a done deal. But does he have to really hit the top 10? Right. Like, is that standard really the standard? So I took a list, of, a look at that list again and thought, where was the floor for being one of the best receivers? Is there a floor that's deeper than that? And guys who, again, in their second year were talked about being one of the best young receivers in the NFL at their time, but have the stats that are here outside the top 10 in each position, right? So receptions wise, uh, Tyreek Hill. 75 catches his second season uh, in the National Football League, but it was a breakout season, 1,000 yards receiving, a lot of touchdowns, a lot of scoring, and he was already being talked about as one of the best young receivers in the National Football League. So if Tyree Kill can do it at 75 catches, then obviously Jahan Dotson can still do it at 75 catches. Then I looked at yards, A.J. Brown, outside the top 10, but again, still considered one of the top uh, young receivers with the Tennessee Titans at the time, 1,075 yards in his second season. Touchdown catches, you go to DeAndre Hopkins. Bottom line, I know D-Hop has kind of fallen off here in the last few years, but bottom line, DeAndre Hopkins, when he was coming up, he came up fast and he came up strong. Six touchdowns in his second season. So really, I think if if Jahan comes away with that contextualized line of stats with of great veterans who become great veterans who were once considered one of the best young receivers in the NFL, then 75 catches, 1,075 yards, and six touchdowns appears to be the bare – like that's kind of the, the floor – uh, that I think we're talking about here for Jahan to kind of make good on this Bleacher Report claim that he, he is going to be known uh, as one of the best young receivers in the NFL by the end of the season. So if you give him back the five games from last year, 
you elevate the three games it took him to really get going once he got back. So really, I mean, we say he missed five games, but really he missed portions of eight, right? Because he missed five completely. And then the three games, the first three games he was back, you could just tell he was kind of getting back in the groove of things. The quarterback situation had changed. So he was getting used to that, getting his role back. So, I mean, really, I look at it as he almost lost eight games, uh, but obviously he played in some of those. So some of the stats are there. So I, you can call it six, six and a half games, almost equivalent uh, that he lost from the injury. So you get those games back, hopefully. You elevate the three games that it took for him to really come back again, You and you give him some stabilized quarterback play and an offense that accentuates his abilities. I think those numbers are well within his reach, honestly. Now, I think that you know the question is going to be how much do they spread the ball? And again, you look at the Kansas City Chiefs offense, they're not really known for honing in on any one guy except for Travis Kelsey, and Jahan Dodson is not Travis Kelsey. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to think of, but I think that the numbers are certainly within reach. In regards to fantasy points, a uh, line of 75 catches, 1,075 yards, and six touchdowns, which is our kind of our contextualized floor uh, line, stat line that Jahan needs to hit in a PPR league, a full PPR league. That would give you 218.5 total fantasy points. That would rank Dotson wide receiver 29, again, among all second-year receivers in PPR fantasy scores over the past 10 seasons, uh, really the nine seasons, including 2023. So wide receiver 29, that's pretty good numbers for a second-year receiver to start climbing the ladders of saying you're one of the best young receivers uh, in their league. Now, our initial no context needed, nobody's going to argue with you. He's absolutely uh, a top 10 second-year receiver in, in the past 10 seasons. That would actually get you 260.6 points, which would be good for wide receiver eight uh, in that group. So actually, among second-year receivers, you're in the wide receiver one uh, category, and that certainly would be qualified as a breakout year. So I'd say we have those lines pretty well drawn. I think you've got kind of your high point like this is your maximum boom nobody can argue with you that Jahan had a breakout season that Jahan is one of the best young receivers in the National Football League and then we've kind of got our contextualized one you can say look he's performing the way that some of the greats in the game uh eventually you know got to that great level uh performed in their second years as well so you can start making that argument so one of the lines right leaves a little bit of question a little bit of wiggle room one of them absolutely uh, does not. So I think those are lines are pretty well drawn to become one of the best young Washington receivers ever in his second season and crack the top 10 among franchise receivers in their second years. He would need 37 catches, which would uh, which would match uh, Ricky Sanders from 1987, 543 yards, which would hit Leonard Hankerson's mark in 2012, six touchdowns, which would hit Art Monk's mark in uh, 1981. Now to have the best year a second year receiver has ever had in franchise history ever across all three stat lines. He needs 88 catches to beat Terry McLaurin's current record of 87 for a second-year receiver in Washington. He did that in 2020. He needs 1,266 yards to beat Gary Clark from 1986, and he needs nine touchdowns, which would beat Charlie Brown in 1983 and Rod Gardner in 2002. So 88 catches, 1,266 yards, nine touchdowns, and Jahan Dotson is the best second-year receiver to ever play for Washington. So if Dotson breaks the top 10 of second-year receivers in the past 10 seasons, He'll also very likely become the most productive second-year receiver in franchise history. So that's a good goal to have. That's a good mark to set for yourself as a second-year player. Let's switch our focus from one second-year player to two first-year players and their lack of contracts. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. <laughs> wrap up this conversation this on this episode uh with uh, a, a question a conversation i was having with a, a text a text conversation i was having with a subtexter on uh wednesday early evening afternoonish uh time frame uh, asking about emmanuel forbes and quan martin and their contract statuses right and whether or not there's something to be concerned about that so as it stands right now emmanuel forbes quan martin are the only two commanders rookies not signed and, and again that's the time of this recording that type of stuff can be get, get done and happen uh, at a moment's notice. So maybe it happened while I'm recording this episode. But if assuming it hasn't, by the time you're listening or watching this, uh, Emmanuel Forbes, Quad Martin, the only rookies, the only drafted rookies not under contract for the Washington Commanders right now. And, and should there be a concern, uh, given the fact that the rookies are literally reporting on Friday for training camp right up front? No, I'm, I'm going to say there's nothing to be worried about right now. I'm going to tell you why. For starters, most of the time when there's a delay in rookie contracts, right, and, and that this isn't new, there's there's delays all the time in rookie contracts uh, being signed, it's because of bonus payouts, right? So more and more bonuses are starting to be paid out in lump sums. And, and it used to be that bonuses would get paid 
uh, you know, at the end of, uh, of a 12 month cycle or like every three months, we'll give you a chunk of it or, or something like that. And that kind of used to be uh, the, the normal operating procedure in the National Football League. But more and more players want their money uh, up front, especially when it's a big time bonus or a big time contract. So you look at like Deron Payne's contract. And I don't know off the top of my head when his bonus got paid or when it's going to get paid. I would assume that Dan Snyder doesn't want to pay his bonus. Therefore, his contract probably says it will be paid within the next 12 months or so, uh, which would give time for the sale to go through. But I don't know that for sure. So just take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but again, more and more, especially high round draft picks or high draft picks, first round draft picks, top 10, all that stuff. They're wanting their bonuses up front, right? 15 days, 30 days, uh, stuff like that. I saw a report that said Chase Young got his signing bonus for his rookie contract within 30 days of signing it because that was in his contract, right? So sometimes that's what the holdup is with these rookie deals is, you know, the team says, hey, look, we'll give you half your bonus 15 days after you sign. We'll give you the other half week eight. And the player says, no, man, I want all my I want my bonus money all within 15 days. And they go back and forth and the agent does their thing and the team does their thing. And eventually they come to an agreement. Right. So for Forbes, if Washington is following the pattern and I call it a pattern, but really, I only know, we only know Chase Young's uh, bonus payout situation. So we're following that pattern. Then perhaps that's what they're doing. Emmanuel Forbes wants his bonus 15, 30 days after he signs his contract. Well, Dan Snyder's not going to pay that bonus. You know what I mean? So if. Emmanuel Forbes signs his contract and, and the, the team uh, agrees to a deal with him that says, well, you'll get your bonus within 15 days. And Dan Snyder still owns the team in 15 days. That check's got to come from Dan Snyder. Uh, and again, he's he's not going to pay for the for the bonus. And uh, I don't know a lot of people that would pay for that bonus in the situation. So really, if that's the situation, then they have to wait until the sale is final. Uh, and then Josh Harris will eventually pay it uh, for Quad Martin. It can still be about the bonuses. Usually that's a first rounder thing. But if he wants his immediately too, the commanders, you know, if they're trying to get it for him as well, uh, that could certainly be a thing. And, um, you know, it's it's something that uh, I can't blame them for wanting either. You know, and the rest of the rookies likely have language where their bonuses, the ones that are getting bonuses are going to get them within 12 months or so to give the team, the organization enough time so that the Josh Harris uh, sale could go through. And then once Josh Harris comes in, you know, if the contract says within 12 months and Josh is like, hey, let's write this check now, give KJ Henry his bonus, then, you know, they can just give KJ Henry. Uh, his bonus. But look, even if Harris was already the owner, it's possible that Forbes' contract might not be done yet because Devin Witherspoon's contract for the Seattle Seahawks also isn't done yet. And he was the first cornerback taken in the draft. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Forbes was the second one. And since Devin doesn't have his done yet, a lot of times agents, players, they want to see what happens to the guy in front of me. What did what did he get? Um, and sometimes the teams want to wait because that kind of sets their floor. Like if Devin takes his bonus over four payments, the commanders will be like, well, you're going to get your, your bonus over four payments. Because the top guy did. And sometimes they go off of franchise histories. You know, everybody's going to pull the thread that helps them uh, personally the most, right? So similarly, right now, Bryce Young's contract with the Carolina Panthers is not complete yet. Uh, but neither is CJ Strouds of the Houston Texans and neither is Anthony Richardson's with the Indianapolis Colts. Because both of those other quarterbacks, CJ and Anthony, are probably waiting to see what Bryce Young's contract looks like as far as bonus payouts and uh, some other things we'll get into here in just a second. So I think that's what's most likely happening here with Forbes and Martin is that they want their bonuses in a lump sum shortly after signing. Ron Rivera is going to try to get that for them uh, for them from you know Josh Harris, the new owner. So honestly, for Martin, it's kind of a crafty tactic, right? Because he's a second-round pick, and I don't think you really see this a lot from second-round picks. But at the same time, you got a new owner coming in right before training camp starts. So the last thing you want as an owner is a rookie holdout uh, your first week on the job. So it almost kind of forces Josh Harris's hand to, to make this happen so that the first – things to happen in his tenure are the signings of the top two draft picks uh, for this year's uh, NFL draft. So another common reason for contract delays are offsets, right? Essentially what offset language says that is if a player is released and then signed by another team, the releasing team only has to pay the player the balance of the remaining money not covered by the new team. So if I understand this correctly, and I think I do, let's say David Harrison gets released by Washington and has $1 million in guaranteed money left on my rookie deal. Well, Washington would, cur would incur a $1 million dead cap hit and have to pay me that money. But if my contract has offset language in it, then the dead cap money stays. Like It's still a dead cap money no matter what. But let's say I then sign with the Baltimore Ravens, move up the, move up the highway a little bit, for $500,000 in guaranteed money. If I have offset language, then Washington would only have to pay me five hundred dollars and then Baltimore would pay me five hundred dollars I make the million I was already supposed to make with Washington. If I didn't have offset language, then Washington would have to give me the million dollars and then Baltimore would give me 500,000. So clearly 
having offset language is better for the team. Not having it is better for the player. And I think the trend that we're moving toward here in the NFL is giving signing bonuses faster, but we're going to take the offset language, right? So the player gives up the offset language. The team offers up the bonus uh, faster and in bigger chunks than, you know, maybe it has been traditionally done. So finally, the third reason I can come up with why there might be a delay is that Washington has a free agent or two that they have got their eyes on. So they're trying to keep up, uh, keep as much cap space free uh, as long as they can. Uh, and then, of course, if they can release Andrew Norwell, if he gets uh, uh, healthy enough to be released, that frees up that cap space. Maybe then you see the deals get done. Um, but again, that's kind of a third not so likely uh, option. So either way here, the CBA only says rookies can't practice in training camp until their contracts are signed. So Forbes and Martin can still report on Friday with the rest of the rookie class, start going through meetings, film study, all that stuff until their deals are done. They just can't practice. So really the timeline to get these deals done uh, runs out the morning of Wednesday, July 6th. That is the first practice uh, that I'm aware of. That's the first practice on the schedule that I got. So uh, July 26th, the morning of that, if the deals are not done, then you have something to worry about. I mean, uh, you know, if, if the 25th comes and the deals aren't done, uh, then maybe we've got something to talk about. But uh, I'm fairly certain that this is all about bonus payouts coming shortly after the deals are signed and Dan Snyder not being the guy to pay them. So, of course, there are always, you know, other potential reasons they haven't been signed yet, but uh, I would not worry about it too much at this point. Um, so at this point, we're going to wrap up this episode coming up tomorrow. We will have another episode. Of course, we're going to be talking about the sale, uh, anything that comes from that comments, all that stuff. And in the meantime, if you've got questions or comments of your own, throw them into the YouTube comments, hit me on Twitter, email me at lockedoncommanders at gmail.com or text me via subtext. As always, I want to thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day, every day and every day. I want to thank you for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. And if you want to continue this conversation or text me your questions yourself, just go to joinsubtext.com slash locked on commanders. And I want to thank you so much for making me part of your day, part of your routine. If you have anything else Washington commanders related that you want to know or discuss, you can also follow me on Twitter at dharrison82. Until we speak again, please be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs>